Wrist my neck on the street. Now I get paid to take risks and repeat. Wrist my neck on the street. Now I get paid to take risks. What's good, my people? It's your boy Josh Nizzy, and welcome to Nizzy Nomics. So in today's video, we're going to talk about optimizing student loan repayments and beyond that, rethinking student loans in general. So in the UK, student loans are kind of dressed up and sold to us as this sort of passive debt that, you know, isn't like any other loan uh, structurally, won't impact our credit um, and is really there to facilitate uh, people who maybe wouldn't have the finances otherwise to be able to go to university um, and take part in like higher education, further education, etc. While this is all well and good, you know, in practice, in reality, it doesn't really work like that. So, you know, the student loan in the UK is definitely not a passive debt because the amount of retrospective changes that have happened over the years is almost ridiculous. So I don't know if you remember when uh, there was like a conservative coalition uh, <laughs> government where um, the conservatives and the Lib Dems formed the coalition and one of the dreams we were sold by Nick Clegg was around uh, student loan caps and all of these stuff and I think that was the year when, uh, I mean correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the year when uh, student loan, the cap on tuition actually uh, tripled from like 3k to 9k. It's a very dynamic uh, loan and the structure of the repayment um, reflect that massively. So because of that, if you're not on the ball and if you're not like, if you don't keep on top of it and at least know like what you're getting yourself into, or you're almost just like blindly signing up to something which uh, in years down the line can come back to bite you in the bum. So I think all of us that kind of went through that process have experienced it personally. And um, from what I can see, a lot of people just don't really uh, engage with it and don't really take the time to understand what it is that they've got themselves into um, which is understandable because it's not the most transparent thing um, at all by any means. What does the current structure of student loans look like? At the moment there is a cap in terms of the tuition loan that you get and there is a cap in terms of maintenance loan that you get so the former is around uh, I think it's around 9k or so and uh, the latter, again, depending on whether you study in London or you uh, live outside of London, it could be between like five to nine thousand um, pounds. So, and that's on a yearly basis, right? So, potentially at the very high end, you could be taking out loans of what eighteen k uh, per year for three years, right? Um, so that's the kind of bog standard structure of the loan. Uh, but then, as well as that, you've got the interest rate that kind of gets charged as well, right? Um, and the way this is baked in is, <laughs> is quite, it's quite interesting because it's just like the most aggressive way you can structure like an interest rate loan. Um, so the rate that they use as a reference is RPI. Uh, RPI is a, a measure of inflation. It tends to be the higher measure of, of inflation compared to like the CPI, which is the consumer price index. Um, RPI is the retail price index and it includes other items that just take the um, that makes the price changes uh, that it's tracking um, reflect at a much higher rate so it's always like the higher number so obviously that's why um, they're using that as a reference side note RPI is actually uh, <laughs> debated as a flawed measure of inflation so Again, that's another debate and that's another citation as to why uh, student loan is, uh, in the UK, student loan is really not passive because it's one of the interest rates that it derives its uh, value from or its measurement from is, is like a dud uh, measurement of inflation. Um, but anyway, whatever. Um, so that RPI inflation number is uh, added to like another number which is like three percent so you're essentially accruing that interest rate on a daily basis um, which means that today's loan principle as in the amount that you borrowed plus the interest for that's calculated based on today is rolled over tomorrow as is rolled over into tomorrow as a new number 
and then that new number, that new total, is charged interest. And then it rolls over to the next day and the next day and the next day. So the rate at which this uh, interest is compounding is literally every day. Um, and it's funny because if you were, I mean, interest rates are basically on the floor at the moment, at the moment but if you were to put money like in a bank account um, and uh, you wanted to like check your rate of accrual, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be on a daily basis. It would probably be like on a monthly basis or something like that. So it just goes to show like how aggressively structured the interest rate term is. Um, and then when it comes to graduation and it's time to start repaying the loan, the way it's structured is that uh, I think the threshold is around like 27k now. Like you, when I graduated, it was like I think 20 between 23 and 25. I don't know. Um, but now it's 27k um, and basically what that means is that anything above that threshold you'll be charged 9% uh, 9% um, goes towards repaying the student loan so if you earn below the 27k threshold then obviously you don't have to pay anything back but the downside to that is that the interest keeps accruing and the principal part of the loan i.e. the amount that you actually borrowed in the first place doesn't get repaid um, at all. So you're just kind of like accruing this massive heap of um, interest costs on top of this debt. So going back to the people that, uh, that earn above the 27K threshold, those guys are in a situation where um, you are repaying, but then the question is, are you repaying in an optimized way, i.e. Could you be repaying in a different structure compared to the standard structure that would make you better off over time? And that's the question that me and a bunch of my friends um, asked ourselves even prior to joining uni, but during uni and a lot more so after we graduated um, in order to figure out what's the best way to, to tackle this um, debt without screwing up other aspects of our lives and whether it's even worth it, right? Because Again, one of the um, terms in the loan is that if you don't repay after 30 years, it's going to get wiped off. However, caveat on that, I don't actually fully trust that term because given the nature of how they've changed the structure of the student loan so much since it was restructured once again in 2012 or so, um, they could easily next year come out and say, actually, you know what? Uh, we're not going to scrap the loans for 30 years. People are living longer and longer. Actually, people's working uh, careers are going to be longer and longer. So therefore, they're going to have more time to repay this loan. So therefore, we're not going to scrap it after 30 years. Instead, we're going to increase that to 40 years. You know, And then all of a sudden, all the people that thought, oh, it gets wiped off anyway in 30 years, they would be in a sticky situation, right? So. Not to say that's going to guaranteed happen, but it's a possibility given the amount of retrospective changes that we've seen, right? So that's kind of the structure of the student loan front to back, how I view it. Um, the fact that it's based on interest rates, which are um, derived from kind of irrelevant inflation measures uh, or hotly debated inflation measures. Um, the fact that the threshold in which you start repaying these loans is quite small so when you're actually making repayments you're not actually chipping away at the principal because the amount of interest that you've accrued in that time is a lot higher so you just end up in this perpetual cycle of you know accruing interest and paying a little bit of principal but it's not really making a debt uh, so <laughs> net, on a net net basis, you're not actually reducing the debt pile. Another tricky thing in the structure of the repayments is that while you're studying, so as soon as you take the first loan in your first year of uni, interest starts to accrue on a daily basis at a rate of RPI plus 3%, right? That's like the highest interest rate that they could charge. Um, and then when you graduate, they say, oh, actually, wait, you know, uh, the interest rate that, we, that we're gonna charge is gonna be dependent on how much you earn. So it, they kind of, it comes across as like a nice thing that they're doing that if you earn less that you'll pay less interest. But actually when you were at uni earning nothing, 
like they were charging the highest interest rate possible uh, again in terms of like their their structure so they were charging RPI plus three percent which is the highest tier but that was during your university studying days where when you didn't have this job that was paying X amount so it's just yeah it's confusing you know it's uh, when you break it down you just kind of understand okay maybe I need to be on a bit more on the front foot when it comes to repaying this loan um, and obviously when it comes to people who are well off this is irrelevant for them because probably they didn't have the loan in the first place or maybe like if uh, you earn enough you can kind of like pay it back super quickly but then there's a bunch of people who are stuck kind of in the middle where they don't earn quite enough to repay it like super fast but they don't earn uh, too little that they're not ever going to get charged and these kind of threshold repayment thresholds you should kind of really think about them in terms of earning curves as opposed to like a current snapshot in time because you know like you could your first job out of uni could be you know like in one in one threshold and then a year later or two years later you end up in a completely different threshold and then you know like five years down the line you end up in a uh, like beyond any threshold and you know the student loan becomes irrelevant so it kind of just depends what your earning curve across time is going to be um, so that's why I think like rethinking student loan is really important for us to do. Now that we know that the structure of the student loan package in the UK is not what it necessarily says on the outer box of the tin. Um, it is a lot more complicated than first meets the eye and it does put, I'd say, a large proportion of people on the back foot um, and really and truly the people that can escape are like this, either the super high earners or the people that, you know, tack tackle it with uh, a bit of vigour um, as opposed to letting it kind of just, you know, do its way with you. So when it comes to thinking about an optimized repayment schedule as an alternative to the standard payments repayment schedule, um, there are a bunch of variables that you need to consider in order to evaluate whether repaying early actually makes sense, right? So the kind of things that you need to consider as variables are uh, what's your earning curve over let's use the, 30, uh, the next 30 years because that's when the loans are supposed to expire. So what's your earning curve over the next 30 years? What's, your, what's the expected inflation curve over that time period? Um, what's your investment hurdle rate, um, i.e. the rate which you expect to get on uh, any investments that you have available to you? Um, you know, what are your personal spending um, commitments, you know, like are you saving for a house, are you saving for a car, are you saving for, do you have a child, like do you need to pay for childcare, are you saving for a holiday, are you saving to buy some drip, like what is it, do you have some personal spending goals. And with all of these variables you can do the maths, crunch the numbers and figure out whether there's an optimised uh, earning figure that makes it worthwhile overpaying at a much faster rate. The main benefit for doing this sort of exercise is that you can save a ton of money on interest repayments if you figure out an optimized uh, schedule versus how much you're earning, you know. So rather than stretching out the standard payment over 30 years and incurring all the interest rate on that um, time period, you might actually be better off in the long term cutting that time period down to say five years for example and overpaying faster but saving on the future interest rate bill so this obviously isn't going to work for everyone and it's not going to be optimal to do so for everyone but it's really low effort to just do the maths a little bit and figure out like where you sit on the curve you know because like you know there's that saying of like better the evil that you know uh, versus the evil that you don't, right? Like, <laughs> if so, I'm looking at like the student loan as the evil, and uh, I rather know where I stand in terms of like the fact that 
I could be optimizing but I decide not to or the fact that I can't optimize at any level so this is just what it is um, I'd rather know that like upfront um, rather than like just being at mercy of all the changes that they decide to introduce retrospectively another benefit is that once the student loan is gone it then frees up cash flow um, for you to do other things with right so prior to having the, the debt repaid obviously there's going to be like a monthly outgoing getting paid uh, getting repaid back to slc and once this payment is gone then you've got another bit of cash flow that comes through during the month that you can allocate to other stuff right so that might i mean it might turn into spending money it might turn into um investment money it might turn into you know like whatever you want to spend your money on it's your money your choice whatever but you know having the optionality that's the main thing that's the main benefit you know like getting that uplifting cash flow um because it makes a big difference you know earning more per month um it, it will almost feel like a bit of a race you know Obviously, the downside is that um, you're going to incur tax on those bits, but nevertheless, cash flow is cash flow. Cash is king. Perhaps my favorite benefit of doing this sort of exercise, especially if you're going to decide to optimize repayments, is that you're no longer going to be at the mercy of an ever changing loan structure, you know, that's decided by the powers that be, you know, retrospectively, just, you know, kind of essentially playing with our lives right like these changes have real life impacts on us the way i saw it was that the sooner i can get myself out of that line of fire the better off i will be over the long term so you know that's like the thought process behind it um we've done the numbers like i'll put a link in the description where you can check out the calculator that we made a couple of years ago you know we just wanted to visualize this exercise and see just on the curve like ballpark you know like in general are we going to be better off are we not going to be better off because the kinds of questions you want to ask yourself for example up front like if rpi is around three four five percent whatever it's going to be i mean next year who knows maybe it gets set even higher the way inflation is going but let's say it's, rpi is three four percent and uh, imagine you're in that top um bracket where you're repaying the higher interest rate so you're adding another three percent on top so you've got like a an interest rate of like six seven percent which is accruing daily um then the question is okay what where can i invest to you know like if you have a spare bit of cash and you're deciding should i use this to pay down some student loan or should i use this to invest or should i use this to do that or this one of the considerations is when you're comparing paying off student loan to um, investing, for example, is that investment going to generate a higher return than the interest that you're being charged accrued daily on the student loan? And you might find that if, you know, the investment hurdle rate is much higher than the interest rate, then obviously it, it makes sense to invest. But conversely, if it's the other way around and actually, you know, the the gain that you're going to get on that investment, if it's low, say, for example, like 5%, then uh, it might not be the best use of capital. You might decide, actually, you know what, why don't we pay down some debt that's more expensive? And to be honest, like, this is how companies fa uh, function, right? Like companies, um, allocation of capital decisions kind of take these sort of things into account. So it's kind of just lending from that framework and just applying it to like individual circumstances so like i said have a play around with um you know the calculator we made um see what it does for your situation and like look at other sources as well right like crunch the numbers yourself um and just start to rethink student loan as like this thing that can just get shoved in the back of your brain that you never that you never look at again because as your financial conditions over time change as well, you might get brought into scope for different parts of the, um, the repayment um, structure. So actually something that you thought was gonna be irrelevant to you, all of a sudden is now relevant for you. So, you know, it's good to just be fully aware, especially those of you that aren't at university yet and you're looking to 
weigh up the costs of whether it's worth it or not. Um, you know, like the whole repayment thing might show you that actually, you know what, maybe certain careers um, are best off being pursued in a different way to university because the cost of university doesn't really add up to, you know, like the, um, the salary ranges and the earning potential within that sector. Um, and conversely, if, if that, you know, that structure does make sense in terms of the sector average salaries and stuff like that, if it does make sense to go to university, then at least you know you have like some better, more in-depth view of what this loan that you're taking on actually is. Um, so yeah, crack on with it, man. Let me know how it goes. Um, be good to chop it up and see. One last thing to note on the overpayment optimizing is that if you're in the upper band, you're going to be repaying ASAP regardless, right? So you might as well optimize. Like if you're going to be re repaying this thing automatically, you may as well optimize from the outset. Um, it doesn't do you any harm. It doesn't, you know, like it doesn't do any harm to ask the question and figure out where you are in terms of optimization repayments. Like, you know, it's one of those exercises where you literally can't go wrong. Never be a source of anxiety, especially in this country, because we do concede that, you know, you it's not like a standard loan in the sense that someone is going to be hounding you down and, you know, like you're going to have bailiffs at your door, etc. So in that sense, it shouldn't be a source of anxiety. But at the same time, we shouldn't stay on the back foot when it comes to thinking about student loan in general. We should most definitely be on the front foot at all times when it comes to this thing. Because like I said, it changes ret retrospectively. You never know when they're going to dial up the tone in terms of aggressiveness. Um, you never know when they're going to change the structure that it negatively impacts you. Um, and at the end of the day, it's our pockets that we need to think about, right? Before you agree to any student loan in general, make sure you understand the terms. People say this time and time and time again. Read the TNCs. If you don't understand, ask someone who does. Ask people that are uh, studying at university already, people that have graduated from university, people that have paid off student loans already, people that are still paying off student loans. You know, like that's one of the benefits of having people that have been through the process long before you. Um, they can answer questions before you actually have to experience it, right? So it's almost like a cheat code. Lastly, devise a plan. So even if that means doing nothing and just keeping to the standard schedule, at least you decided that, right? Because you evaluated a few things and the, the thing that made the most sense was sticking to the normal schedule. So make sure you devise a plan, make sure you evaluate where you are on the curve, whether there's some sort of optimized level at which if you're earning X amount, it means that you should start repaying back faster. Um, and, you know, take care in, in what you're doing because at the end of the day, it's it's your life, man. Fucking hell, like, YOLO now, whatever. Anyway, guys, thanks for rocking with me in another video. I'm gonna catch you at the next one. Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Make sure you plug into all our platforms, the mailing list, and I'll catch you at the next one. Peace. Army said earn then return But before that make sure that you learn Yeah I came from the gutter All I did was swap one block for another